All right, welcome back to another episode of the Casey Campbell Podcast. Casey Campbell here with you, of course, and we're pleased to be joined by the one, the only, Brock Beard is joining us. Uh, Brock, thank you for uh, taking some time to talk with us. Certainly. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Okay, so there's a lot of things I want to discuss with you. Always, um, There's always a lot of things about, you know, with you and, and of course, NASCAR, of course, um, from you writing about the last car to your rise of the field fillers, and of course, uh, you announced some starting lineups for about like four years. So, um, first off, let's start with the uh, the rise of the field fillers episodes that you kind of started. What was that like to you know put those together? Well, you know, it's a good question because it's it's kind of a bizarre bit of subject matter to talk about some of these drivers and teams uh, that uh, really struggled in the 2004 season. But there's a lot of overlap course with the last car website uh, i like to think that if i started writing the last car site in 2004 instead of 2009 these would be the teams i would write about so in a way it's kind of making up for lost time uh discussing competitors and some of which are still around today uh, carl long will be uh, in the series later on as well uh and uh figures uh, prominently as well so um yeah it's just a series this was originally going to be a book it was going to be another book i was going to be working on and then i really figured that, well, it's probably going to be a little difficult to market that because uh, I don't know how many other people besides uh, uh, myself will be interested in reading it. Uh, but I think it, especially by being in 2004, I had just a lot of video content and it really occurred to me last summer, you know, let's just make this a video series. I was kind of at a crossroads as to what I was going to do next on the channel. And I wanted to do some like episodic series there. And uh, it just really uh, picked up momentum from there. I've actually kind of had to kind of pace myself a little more with this latest episode here because I, I felt like you know I was almost like too eager to get to the next one I want to like okay let's make sure we got all the information possible because one thing that I've discovered along the way is that each of these teams and drivers uh, they have such a rich history and you know sometimes you know you, you you're never going to get every bit of detail in there but if you just chew it over just a little bit more sometimes you find really interesting bits and I think a lot of viewers have responded well to that. So what's the most interesting thing you've done? I saw the, uh, you know, the one you did with Phoenix Racing and, of course, James Finch, of course, uh, you know, the Morgan Shepard one, you know, Kirk Shelmerdine you did, and you said you were going to do Carl Long later on. Mm -hmm. uh, what's been the most interesting one that you've done with the, with those? Well, you know, it's, it's hard to pick one because each of them is, is very different from one another. Uh, you can have, uh, you know, a... a uh, you know, like you mentioned, Morgan Shepard and Kirk Shelmerdine being owner drivers, having a very different experience from, say, a guy like Don Arnold or uh, James Finch as, as outsiders, you know, trying to kind of get into the sport. And but having the same, you know, objective and, and, and this one particular season that kind of brought them all together. It's hard to pick certain moments, you know, that stand out from uh, from one to the next. But um, I think the biggest thing is that, you know, uh, how it ties into the sport today. And when you hear about some of the big teams today that, you know, complain about drivers that are kind of in their way, lap traffic, big issue, especially at the concrete tracks like Bristol and Dover, we've heard it a lot more. Uh, Kyle Busch, of course, very outspoken on drivers like the teammates over at Rick Ware Racing. Very same debates that we had back in 2004. Uh, I was in college during that time. So, you know, it's kind of, you know, being able to remember moments in the not too distant future in the sport and how they resemble things today and how, um, you know, and, and also which kind of teams that are still in the sport today uh, in that same sense. So, um, but yeah, again, uh, you know, a, it, a lot of those moments I've basically put into the series already, but I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, I think what's interesting the most to me is, is what kind of history kind of gets tied into it. Uh, like talking about the Mikasuki tribe and uh, their history with uh, the James Finch uh, story. Um, I almost was incur I was almost thinking to kind of make a combination there that, you know, like the Mikasuki people, how they were uh, very resilient against, uh, you know, against the colonists and, and tried to really protect uh, their lands. I tried to, I was almost thinking of drawing a comparison with James Finch and how he stayed in the sport for a long time. I almost thought that was kind of a bridge too far because I wasn't sure uh, how people would be, be uh, very different circumstances and what were at stake. But I almost felt that there was kind of an angle there of, of that kind of resiliency against, um, you know, other uh, other forces there. And, and I think there was some kind of similarity there in the sport. So I guess that's one part that kind of stood out to me. Well, you never know. James Finch could be back because, of course, his 15-year-old uh, his son, Jake Finch, is uh, currently uh, 
making his ways up the the racing ladder. So, um, you know, bring up an interesting point about, you know, 2004. And that was a really interesting time because you had all these, not just the rise of the field fillers, but you had all these interesting types of teams that, you know, weren't really up there. You had, you had Ganassi and where, which they were, of course, Dodge was still in, you know, they Dodge was still a prevalent source of that. You had the Petty Enterprises teams and you had PPI with Craven. Um, what, what was, what was NASCAR like in, in, in 2004? I mean, I remember it, but, um, what was, how different was it back then to, for fans that may not remember it? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I really try to draw into that in, in the series to try to make it seem as current as possible, uh, in there. But, you know, I think, you know, the, the biggest difference, of course, was, you know, you would have large entry lists and entry lists to the point where you would even have like a number of DNQs and, and that ends up being kind of a feature in the series as well. Um, and there was a lot of unpredictability as to which teams were uh, going to stay in the sport and grow and which ones were just going to kind of flare out. You don't really see as much of that in the cup series, really not so much even in the other lower divisions as much these days. Yeah. And there was always a degree of unpredictability as to how many teams were even going to go for the full season. And of course that played a big role in the 2004 year. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, it, it, one thing I thought was very strange about it was that it seemed like the nucleus of, you know, what drivers were all the big names uh, was very compressed that year because you did have a number of fewer full-time teams that were competing uh, that season. And it, and it was, it was noticeable because uh, in the coverage and the break in the race broadcasts, you know, there was, it, there was very little coverage of these teams, the field fillers in the back of the field. Uh, and you can notice at the beginning of the season, they'll start talking about them a little bit. And then they talk about them less and less to the point by the end of the year, you know, it's almost not a storyline at all. That was actually kind of one thing that was difficult in trying to make it a book is that I wanted to make it a chronological thing, but it seemed like with each and every one of these teams, there'd be a lot of information in the beginning of the year, and then it would just taper off as the sport was kind of recovering and more full-time, higher-funded teams were kind of getting into the sport there. Um, so, uh, you know, that's that was really a big challenge from there. And then, of course, I think the other thing was, is again, a lot of this kind of happened, you know, very quietly in the background because NASCAR was bringing in, you know, Nextel, bringing, introducing the chase, Dale Jr. won the Daytona 500. There were a lot of storylines from that small nucleus of big teams that kind of outshone a lot of this that was happening. But every once in a while, as you see with Derek Cope and his great qualifying run at Darlington yeah. or um, right. other field fillers along the way, sometimes they would break into the storyline there and people would have to talk about them. And yeah. uh, this is kind of an effort to kind of bring that to life. Yeah, I forgot about Derek Cope's qualifying run at Darlington. Um, you know, that was also Terry Labonte's last year too, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. His last full time year. His last full time year, I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So, in interesting things about you know with that with that season and as as you know as time goes on, you know you start to see more of those teams coming to the sport. You know around two thousand five too, and then so they're kind of coming in two thousand six, and then really start to you know when Toyota first came in two thousand seven. You could do a whole documentary on on Toyota's first year in the cup series oh, back in 07. Um, is that something that you, you made particularly the next, you know, series, you know, examining some of the, you know, top things like, you know, Toyota's entry into the, into the cup series, or, you know, I, someone told me about, you know, the rise and fall of Roush Fenway. Um, mm -hmm. Someone talked about that. Is there any other ideas that you have Brock? There's there's definitely other ideas there and, and other ideas with with how this series is going to go, because, I mean, um, when I started doing it, um, you notice in the Kirk Shelmerdine episode, I kind of glossed over the last couple of years of Kirk's team before they shut down. And I kind of had to backtrack there because I really my strategy was originally to, to kind of delay some of that and do something with that later. Uh, but of course, the later, you know, uh, later episodes are kind of having more complete view of each of these teams and drivers in each episode, which seems to be uh, lend itself more. Uh, but to answer your question, like, you know, um, I, I am thinking about doing something with other time periods in the sport and trying to kind of capture those periods as well. Um, you know, again, it could be even earlier than 2004, not just not just later as well. But um, 
I think that's really the biggest thing is, is to really kind of just make those period, this time period seem really alive where you can really kind of put yourself in that time and understand how, how different it was from, you know, the way the sport is now, but also how, what things stayed the same. Uh, so that's, you know, it's, 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 there's some potential there. I don't mean to be kind of nebulous on that, but um, you know, that's, there, there, there are some, some long-term thoughts of, you know, other time periods of the sport that I'll probably do it on the channel. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, you're also, you also were a, a part of the, the IndyCar documentary, of course, you mm -hmm. know, one of the most troubling times that the sport has had. And many people still say that it hasn't recovered from the split back in, um, back in the, back in the mid nineties. Um, mm -hmm. What was being a part of that project like? Because the last, I, I watched the first three episodes and I know, I think the last one's coming out in a few weeks. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But what was that like to be a part of? Because, you know, many people still say that IndyCar may, that took decades for IndyCar to recover from that. Absolutely. And, and again, first of all, uh, full credit to uh, NASCAR Man History on YouTube, uh, YouTube for that. Uh, uh, he has done all the heavy lifting on um, writing the script and doing the research and the uh, video editing on that. So uh, this is uh, one that uh, he's been very passionate about. Uh, he's been talking a lot about the IRL split uh, with CART and uh, in a couple of his other shorter videos that we've worked on in the past. Uh, I've just been the one fortunate enough to do the narrations for him there and uh, very pleased at, at the responses as videos have been getting. But it's also been kind of instructive for me uh, personally because I grew up much more on the stock car racing side. Uh, I didn't watch as much open wheel racing there. And, you know, it's it's definitely cast a lot of this in in a new light for me. You're just understanding how contentious it was, as you're saying, um, and and how, uh, you know, it's it, it really even and also how it kind of played a role into why NASCAR was building in popularity at the same time. Uh, you know, this kind of split, not just between the IRL and CART, but between IndyCar racing and stock car racing, where you know, the American motorsports, you know, uh, uh, focus was not able to be on just one or the other that, 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 you know, that, well, that it was on one or the other, that it kind of shifted from one direction to that. So that was really, you know, that's kind of, it, it's helped me kind of understand it a lot better as somebody with more of a NASCAR background to say, oh, well, this is why this happened, or this is why uh, the Brickyard 400 occurred when it did. And this is why, you know, stock car racing, you know, had all these sponsors and these sponsors that maybe used to be in IndyCar. Um, it's very, it's very interesting to see that play out. And, and uh, again, kudos to NASCAR Man History for putting this together because it's been a, a fascinating project for sure. You know, one of the most interesting things about that was, you know, just to see how much tension there was between the IRL, CART, and everybody else involved in it because, you know, I remember people telling me about, yeah, I went to the U.S. 500 because I'm in Michigan. So, of course, Ooh. it was at MIS. And um, it was it was interesting to say the least. But, you know, did you learn how much did you learn from doing that project it, in mainly from all the uh, different aspects from it? Did you know that there was that much tension in there? And do you think that IndyCar has recovered from that? You know, it's hard to say. I mean, it, it definitely, um, you know, the, the time that I focused much more on IndyCar was around the time that the, the, of the reunification that kind of pulled me back in. So I, I can't really say how, how typical that is uh, for most people there. But I, I do know that, especially since 2010, 2011, thereabouts, as, you know, the sport uh, was, was really focusing much more on the Indy 500. I feel that the IndyCar is really done pretty well actually in the years since then. I mean, I'm, I'm no David Land when it comes to uh, the IndyCar uh, knowledge, but I, I think that in this last decade, I think they've, they've really gone back to at least making the Indy 500 just as, as prestigious as it used to be uh, before the split. I think that they have a very strong field. Uh, I think to, when Takuma Sato won the Indy 500 the first time a couple of years ago, uh, watching the starting grid for that race, just remarking at all the talent that's in there. Um, I think it's very fortunate that it worked out that way. Uh, but uh, when you compare that to, yes, these times in the split where you had just virtual unknowns, I mean, what former airline pilots and um, uh, stuntmen and people driving extremely old cars out there, which is fascinating to me because it reminds me of the field filler series in that sense. I didn't think such a thing was possible in open wheel racing because if you're just even a little bit off pace, 
Um, you want to talk about dangers of lap traffic or the dangers of inexperience, um, open wheel racing, they literally put their lives in, in their hands because you got even less protection, at least at that time period. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's what makes it, uh, you know, that's what makes it interesting. But I think that, you know, really, I think that I, I, I feel pretty confident at least how the Indy 500 has been doing since the reunification. As to the overall health of the series, it's hard to say. It still seems like NASCAR is kind of leading the way a bit motorsport. I know that they've struggled as well, but it seems like they're still ahead of IndyCar to a certain degree, but that might just be my own bias speaking in that sense. Would you ever consider doing anything with the NHRA? You know, I don't have I don't have enough backing uh, or background in, in the NHRA. I still uh, I haven't actually even been to a, a, a drag race in person before. I keep meaning to do the one in uh, Sears Point. There, I was going to do it last year before, of course, all this happened and then the, <laughs> it got wiped off the yeah. schedule there. But um, you know, I'd love to. I'd, I'd be I, I I'm definitely open to learning more about the sports history, just as I have with uh, with IndyCar. I'm not sure what NASCAR man's uh, background is with it, but he does seem to have a very good, well-rounded experience in uh, even sports car racing and uh, other disciplines there. Uh, as to whether that's going to be something that's further down the line on my channel, maybe not, because my my wheelhouse is more in the Cup Series. Uh, whether it's in NASCAR man's uh, you know uh, future catalog, stay tuned. So, you know, back in the, you know, I could, I mean, there's a lot of things I want to get and hopefully we can have you on again because there's always, sure. you know, I'm always a fan of the history of, of the sport, especially, you know, I, I kind of, I'm thinking about like doing like, you know, like some docu-series on like the heyday of the sport from like 1999 to like, I, I don't know what you, what you would rather call that the end of the, like, the real like the mid like 2000s when NASCAR was at its Ooh. one of its highest points would you say maybe like 2000 maybe Gen 4 it's like 2007 would you say um probably I think it, it's it's I think that's really especially now I, I I think I think this year I mean even though Fox and and the other um uh, NASCAR itself is you know or NBC also but I was thinking in terms of the the best season ever tagline that Fox specifically has yeah. put forward this year um, you know, and, and, and I think, I think we have a lot of great storylines this year. And I think the sport is, is generally trending the right direction with some of these new teams in there. Uh, the number of overall teams, I think is still a problem, but that's, you know, a whole other topic there. But, um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of when the peak was, it's, it's hard to say, I kind of want to, yeah, I think maybe it seems like Toyota was the very peak when, when they first came in and you had, you had really for the first time since I'd say maybe 1994, really good quality teams that were failing to qualify, that the DNQs weren't just underfunded guys or teams that were just part-time. These were full-time efforts that suddenly were falling out of championship contention just from DNQs. Uh, look at the struggles of Team Red Bull and just trying to get off the ground that year. I think A.J. Allmendinger didn't qualify for his first race until Bristol, which is like the fifth yeah. or sixth race of the season. I remember watching that and be like, oh my goodness, finally getting in there. Um, you know, that was that 2007 season was was extremely competitive there. It's actually kind of surprising. Jimmy Johnson uh, got the uh, was able to get the championship for the second straight year that time around. But part of that was them figuring out the car tomorrow, which on top of all of that was a whole other challenge for everybody, uh, which I also think. But I think that's also probably why it could be argued that that was really the peak. Because once you had the car tomorrow introduced, um, you know, teams kind of scale back a little bit or at least seem to. And uh, that was kind of part of the issue with, um, you know, you, you also started seeing combination sponsors instead of just one sponsor the entire year. Dale Jr. and Tony Stewart's uh, later in 2009, right, that is um, kind of being pretty good examples of that. Uh, but, um, you know, I think that the 2007 was, was probably the peak, but um, how quickly the decline was after that. Uh, 2009 was very similar to 2004 uh, with a lot of uh, uh, start and park efforts that time. So it could yeah. certainly be argued that that was probably the trend. Maybe new rise of the field fillers for 2009. Remember Prism Motorsports. There you go. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but what, and, and my, my last thing, you know, and I'll, and I'll discuss more with you on later episodes because, you know, as no, I, I'm a history, I'm a, I love learning about the history of the sport because that's, you know, I've been a NASCAR fan all my life. And obviously this is my fifth year doing coverage in NASCAR. But okay. the COT, the car of tomorrow, you know, you know, the big, the big ugly wing plate and all that. And, you know, 
the, the spoiler and splitter and all that. It's what was when we, I, I, I remember the COT and I was like, when I was a kid, I think it was like 10 or 12. And I was like, what is this thing? I, it's like the car, the car looks ugly. Um, watching the qualifying practice sessions at Bristol. What, what was the COT like, you know, just watching it and racing it? What was it like to watch? I distinctly remember the first weekend that they introduced the car tomorrow to run at Bristol in the spring race. And um, I remember thinking we were going to the local dirt track at the time, the Antioch Speedway. And everybody was, you know, there were, there were some people that were talking about it at the time. And, and I was thinking like, oh my goodness, this is a completely new car. Nobody knows what it's going to do. It's going to make racing really unpredictable. You know, I, I was thinking like, oh my gosh, maybe Tony Raines will win in the Hall of Fame racing car, win at Bristol. And it's just like, um, and, and just thinking that just like the possibilities were endless. Um, that certainly didn't turn out to be the case. Uh, like I said earlier, Hendrick Motorsports in particular seemed like they just completely figured that car out for everybody else. By the time you got to Martinsville, you got Gordon and Jimmy Johnson banging fenders uh, off each other. And of course, Kyle Busch, back when he was driving for Hendrick, won that first Bristol race. Um, and, uh, and then by 2008, you really had the championship pretty much decided between the only three drivers that won the lion's share of the races between Carl Edwards um, and uh, Kyle Busch and Jimmy Johnson that season. Uh, so, you know, it was, it, it was a little disappointing uh, that, that it worked out that way. But again, it was, it was an indicator of, of, you know, just the richer teams just getting richer. And I think this is something that NASCAR is going to have to worry about with this next gen car coming in. Even though they kicked that another year down the line, at least we'll see if, if anything changes with that. Um, this is going to be something that you know uh, is going to really you know potentially be a problem for some of these smaller teams out there. You know, I know that that uh, when I did that video on again racing, for example, they were talking about the car tomorrow being like a, a, a way to level the playing field, and they thought, okay, well we're going to invest in this do this three or four car effort. And then by the time the car tomorrow comes in, we're going to have a leg up on all those guys. Problem was they had to do a full season with the old car running most of the races. And I think that played a big role into why that team ultimately just fell apart uh, partway through 2007. Uh, I think it was just too much for them to, to work with. I think there were other factors at play uh, that we talked about in that video I did with Slap Shoes, but I think that was another piece of it. And I, I heard very similar things from other small teams. They're saying like, okay, well, this next gen car is going to come in. We'll be able to close the gap. I'm not sure if that's going to be the case, especially with all the crazy, you know, uh, almost Formula One style, uh, what rear diffusers and all this other stuff on there. You're going to see Stuart Haas and Penske and Hendrick, especially Hendrick having a great season this year, figure it out before everybody else. And it's, going to be the same battle that we've seen before i think people need to keep their expectations a little bit reasonable but that's that's really what the car tomorrow felt like back in 2007 i think we're going to see the same thing next year if that's when the car gets introduced or whenever that point's going to be yeah of course remember gin had to uh, merge with dei i think if, if i'm not mistaken or maybe yeah. dei bought them out because yeah. as well that because i remember like joe nemechek and sterling marlin they they had their ride. I mean, they were out of a ride. Mark Martin was still there because now he was moved, slid into the DEI part of the stable. But mm -hmm. yeah, for sure, and, uh, it'll be interesting to see how all that goes. And that was, uh, of course, the Gin documentary. I haven't had a chance to watch it, but I'm going to get a. Oh, I didn't mean to spoil it too much there. There's a lot more in there than that. Than oh, that. I know. I know. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, Brock Beard, thank you so much for coming on. I always love learning about the history of the sport. Let's have you on again in, you know, different parts of the season so we could talk about, you know, different time periods in NASCAR and how maybe they relate to what happened today. Well, I'd be happy to. You know where to find me. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem, man.